I'm not going to try to get everybody to run everything at the same time um, uh, on their own machines as we have it. So there are two versions of the, they're, they're the exact same thing. There's a .html version, which is an R markdown version of the code and the examples and everything's run and you can see what happens. There's also a .r thing called network viz moody 20.18.r. I'm stealing variable names now from my graduate students. Um, uh, I, my files used to have eight characters max. Um, uh, now I have sentences. But in any event, so if you run that R script, um, uh, you should be able to do everything that the examples go through. I'm not even going to try to do it live, um, uh, though it's here. So um, if any people want to do it this way, right, you can just load it up and run through it. But instead, what I thought I would do is just talk us through the pieces. You can see what the results are. We talk about why we do those pieces. And then you can go back in the, you know, the beauty and comfort of your own home and you can run it or you can run it right now. And if it's not working for you, raise your hand. One of the beautiful people in a blue shirt will come and help you. Um, uh, and uh, the one good thing about most of my code is that I, um, I code in R the way the Abbas sings in English, right? So I've memorized particular pieces and I make it happen right. Um, and so it usually works um, uh, because it worked, um, but I, I can't extend too far from it. Um, uh, and so you'll see how that works out. So the, um, the, the, the basic strategy, the, the plan for doing network visualization sort of flows into the kinds of strategies that um, uh, Maria was telling us about yesterday. First, we're going to start by setting up what the problem is we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve is usually either learning something about our set or communicating something about our set. The two real reasons to use visualization are for exploration or for explanation, right? And so in the first case, you're using visualization because you don't know what the hell is there and you're trying to learn. To give you an example of this, I am somehow got myself um, uh, roped into um, a, a giant project modeling GitHub. It's not a health project, it's a different kind of project. And I know very little about the network structure of GitHub. Um, but after spending just a day pulling off pieces of this network and visualizing it, I learned more about what the structure of that network was than I'd ever learned by reading a bunch of papers about what get, how get, the GitHub structure worked. I learned about the various and sundry ways in which it was centralized and so, and so forth. And you learn that just by poking around and pulling at things and playing at them and seeing what's there. And so the exploration phase of network analysis and network visualization need not be as rigorous as a lot of the other stuff. The goal, it doesn't even have to be pretty. It has to be useful. Right? You need to get something out of it that says, ah, that looks like crap, but it looks like crap because 95% of my nodes are pendants. Right? And so now I've learned something about my setting. And so these pendants then are something that I want to do something with and see what kind of structure is left over after playing with that. That's very different than what my goal is to figure out that I've done a model, I've realized that the um, degree distribution strongly constrains the core size of random networks I'm in a particular way that's important for diffusion. And so I want to be able to highlight that core periphery distinction in a way that an audience can get it at a glance. That's a different kind of visualizations problem. We're going to talk about both of those um, uh, a little bit today. So the first thing we're going to need to do if you pull up your, um, uh, uh, if your, your, your code is we've got to clear out you know, the workspace and we're just going to start from scratch, right? So we clear everything out. Then we go through, we load our various um, uh, packages. This is the base set of packages that we've been using. So we have dplyr, um, tidyr, reader, and so forth. These are things that pull us out. I honestly don't know if you need all of these for every bit of the script that's here. This isn't a minimal set. This was a set that um, uh, it worked for me. Um, and so there might be some extra things here. You can get rid of them, try it, see which ones you absolutely need. Um, uh, so the first thing we're going to do is set our working directory. Um, uh, I've set up a special directory where I put the data set. We're reading in this base CSV file. Um, we're going to read it in with column names. You run this through. We pulled it out to this little um, uh, thing called add health school base. So this is going to be a simple column data set. And so it's going to have a series of columns. And so in this case, we're going to have the population behavior. We're going to probability of being sick. A few other network items that are in there, but they don't list at all. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing down and my goal is to get from this large you know, survey bit of data set we have down to a manageable bit that we can do for this exercise. And I do that in three steps. The first thing I do is I pull out um, uh, just the uh, variables that I need that are part of the edge set, right? So I'm going to, no, sorry, right here we go. I first just pull out the, um, uh, the variables that I need. So I have ego, the male friends, the female friends, and this is some things I'm going to want to color by, grade and sex, for example, and then the community ID. 
And so then what I'm doing is I'm piping that into this filter command, and so I'm filtering out on community ID is equal to one, so I'm just taking the first school. I'm taking the first school because there's 71 nodes in the first school, and it's gonna make a nice pretty picture, and I don't gotta worry about runtime because it's a small network, right? So now I have a data set that went from 75,000 nodes to 71 nodes, right? So that's what happens in this step. And then I filter that I turn this adds list, which has a row for each respondent and a column for each of these variables. I'm then going to turn that into a, uh, an edge list by using the pipe commands that John um, uh, and uh, Maria showed us earlier. Um, yeah, um, uh, and we're going to do that by creating an ego ID. We're going to create a variable called sex. And we're going to gather these things up um, uh, and send them out. And so then we end up with um, uh, an edge list. Remember, our edge list has a bunch of these 9999s. These are people who named friends outside of the school. We're getting rid of those. So we're essentially saying, give us all the cases where that's not the case. Um, uh, and then uh, my new edge list, all my edges now is just equal to the selecting the, those that have IDs and targets. So I've gotten rid of the extra bits that I don't need. Right, so now we have a, uh, an edge list and a node set built up here. And so we're going to use both of those next. So I'm going to start with, as we were talked about earlier, there are two different packages that are used for network analysis in R usually. One is the statnet package built by Carter Butts, and um, the other is the iGraph package. Just because I got this code to work first, I'm going to use the um, statnet package. And then later in the night when I got iGraph to work, that's why it's at the bottom of the set. So that's, that's the length of the logic of the unfolding here, just so you know. Um, and so, so first we're going to pull up um, uh, the SNA program, um, which is part of StatNet. It reads through, gets all the elements we need, tells us what's there, a little bit of um, uh, copyright stuff, some other pieces that we might use. And one of the things that we want to do now is create a network. And because I'm lazy and I don't like to type a lot, I call my network G, just for graph, right? Um, uh, so it's just a single letter G. And so as network, the edge list, right? Now this is a pretty poor practice to do this. As um, uh, we learned yesterday, what I should have done was initialize this network to have 71 nodes, made it empty, and then put this in. I just got lucky in this case, and the, um, uh, the edges have, uh, have an ID. The person with the largest ID is actually in, has an edge. And so because there's, a, there's an edge with 71 in it, um, uh, it builds me a network of 71 nodes. But this isn't best practice, right? So best practice would be the code that we saw the other day. And so then I'm going to attach to this graph a vertex feature. And that's what the percent %V percent does. If instead it was an edge feature, it'd be percent %E percent, right? So I can map things from another data set to my graph object by version of this, uh, this vpipe operator. And I'm going to take from the original edge list data set, which remember has 71 observations, I'm going to take the grade variable, the sex variable, and I'm going to calculate degree. And I'm going to put all three of those things as attributes on the graph, right? So really all we're doing now is we're building an object that has the things in it that we need in order to make some pictures that we want to play with. And so then we're going to do the super simplest possible network. We're going to say, let's plot this graph. The vertex color is going to be by grade in the school. The size of the vertex is going to be size proportional to degree. I'm ready to go. I'm going to learn something about my graph. That's what I get. <laughs> right. well, that's not very useful. Um, so what happened here? So what happened here is that StatNet um, is really giving me a radius equal to the size of the degree. And a radius gives a really big area, right? And so what I'm going to do instead is after hitting myself in the head and looking around for a while and figuring out what's there, I realize that what I really want to do is take log degree, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a, a vertex attribute, which is the log of the degree plus one. We add one to it because the log of zero is senseless, right? So we end up doing it that way. That gives us something else. And now we get. The simplest basic picture um, uh, from the default layout set um, uh, where we have a directed graph from nodes to other nodes. Um, for some reason, I lost my, in this case, it looks like I lost my isolates again. Um, that's because I only pulled in the edge list, right? So that's where I'm at. There you go. Um, now, it turns out there are other sort of ways that you can do um, uh, StatNet um, uh, style um, uh, uh, graphs. Um, but for, the, for whatever reason, I didn't bring a lot of them in here. Why did I not? I guess I'm going to, I wanted to show, focus on other layout algorithms. Um, so there are other things you can do with StatNet layouts. In fact, one of the, the sort of amazing things that Carter Butts did is he created an interactive version of a graph object here. So you can drag things around on the screen. It's clunky. It's slow. 
um, but it works. And the fact that it works in this environment is kind of remarkable, actually, um, because he doesn't export it somewhere else, and then you have you play with it. It's actually live in the set. And so um, uh, right now, the default is interactive is off, but if you want to make this graph interactive, just as one of these plot.networks, do comma interactive equals true, and it'll, it'll give you that set. All right. So now let's assume what you really wanted to do was one of these really cool interactive graphs. You want to get people out playing with it and sort of engage them in their set. And so to do that, I'm going to use the D3 language, which is a, a, a wonderful um, a graph, um, a graphing language um, for, for websites generally, but is also um, incorporated into the R framework. And but like iGraph, um, uh, D3 expects our vertices to be um, indexed from 0 to n minus 1 as opposed to from 1 to n. So you'll notice that we're going to create an, a new version of our network which is the node ID as what it really was, minus one, right? And our edges are gonna be the original edges minus one. So we're taking all those indices we had before, subtracting one from them, so now they run from zero to n minus one instead of one minus n. It's a silly thing to have to do, but we do it anyway. So then we do a forced layout. So this is gonna be a spring and better style network on this edge with those nodes, right? And we're gonna say the source is the ID, the target, is the target. We're going to group it by a group variable, which we named up here. Where did that go? I know I have it somewhere. Well, I'm sure I named it because it works. So um, there it is. Um, these pieces are, are built in just as we have them. And it generates this little graph where it's colored by um, uh, 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 what do you call it, colored by grade in school. Now this looks fine when you look at it, but what's kind of nice about it is this is one of those sort of interactive pull it around and move it sets. Um, so you can get in, wiggle around and see what's there. Um, I like these kind of graphs in the sense that you can zoom in. Oh, this is not the right one. In the web page, you can, if you pipe this to a web page, you can um, actually zoom in and out as well. I'm not sure why it's not letting me do that here. Um, but notice that when you click on it, it tells you that that's node 53. It highlights the ego network, so you can see which ego this person is tied to. Um, this person's tied to a different set. Um, and then you have these um, uh, you know, pieces floating around. This is also, I think the real best thing, this particular layout algorithm, and there's a couple of different versions of this we're gonna show you today, um, is really good at, is helping you understand what a spring embedder is really doing, right? So this is, when you see a spring embedded graph and you're trying to figure out how that layout happened, this is how it happens, right? And you can also see how it goes wrong. So if I take this node and put it on that side, I can actually do some tricks here where I would um, sort of tangle the springs. And in the process of tangling the springs, it's not gonna be a very good fit. And so sometimes you look at one of your, your, your runs, you do a layout, and you get an image that doesn't look quite right, and you can't figure out why, you know in your head that these groups shouldn't be where they are. It's probably because some springs got crossed, and it's, a, it's at a local minima in the optimization routine. And so if you were to go in and essentially untangle it a little bit, you'll get a much better layout. And, and so oftentimes you wanna try a different random seed when you're um, uh, doing your layout, or in something like this, you can just go in and help spread things out a little bit, let them come back to where they're at, and that should get you um, a better layout, right? And so in this case, we got grades um, uh, left on top of each other. Um, all right, so now we're gonna bump into iGraph and use some of their tools. Um, so this is the code, I, I didn't do it here, but if you want to pipe it directly to an HTML page and be like Kieran and have one of those online webs with you know, all your best friends' networks on there, um, you can just do it as simple as this. And this is a nice, I mean, this is, is about as easy as it gets. It's the exact same code we had before, the little pipe operator, and then specify an HTML page. And you can just write this thing right out there, and it, um, it works quite nicely. Um, in fact, it works so nicely. Am I brave enough to think this will work? John says, no, don't go live. Um, oh, there it is. All right, and so this is the, it actually works a lot faster in the, um, uh, you know, in the native format than it does um, embedded in R. But, so that's just as easy as that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, oh, wrong one. So now we've pulled out a series of, I, I was a bad person. Um, I loaded iGraph, but I didn't detach um, statnet, right? And so what I've looked at, now I have these two conflicting packages going on at the same time. And it's gonna tell me, all right, you're, you're, that was the choice you made. And so in terms of, because I made that choice, these things now, um, that used to be available in the SNA packages, are no longer available, right? And so if I'm typing something and think I'm gonna get between the centrality the way that statnet types it, in this case, I wouldn't. I would get it the way 
that iGraph calculates it, right? So you should pay attention to these kinds of warnings when it gives you that um, because it probably means you did something you shouldn't have done. Um, but there you have it. Um, so there are a whole series of these things yelling at me because I didn't do what I thought I would do. Um, and so instead now then I'm going to take the graph that I had before, um, uh, which is this set of edges that I generated up above um, uh, as a data frame, and I'm going to say create a graph from a data frame. This is one of the nice things I like about the iGraph package is that it has a bunch of different ways of building the graph. I can do a graph from a matrix, I can do a graph from a list, I can do a graph from a data frame. So it does sort of make that relatively easy to get a, a graph object if it's already set up where the vertices are indexed the way they're supposed to be and so forth. This is what the default plot of a network object in um, uh, uh, iGraph looks like. It's kind of a mess, right? So you're not getting a whole lot out of that. And it's ugly for a number of reasons, right? And, and this, is a, this is a piece that I've, I've never really understood in terms of coders, is that you often put in the opportunities to make reasonable choices, right? So as a user, as you're going to see in a second, we're going to go in and change a bunch of things, and it's going to work great, and you're going to have a beautiful thing, but you don't use those as the defaults. The defaults are just badass ugly. And so like, you would never want a graph with arrows like double the size of your nose. That just makes no sense, right? There's no, there's no universe in which that's something you'd actually want to do. But instead of making the default something sensible, the defaults are always like this. And this is part of the reason that people generate really ugly graphs in publications is they push the plot button and go home, right? And so it turns out you can't quite do that. Um, so let's do a little bit different, like let's make our edge arrow size a little smaller and let's get rid of the vertex labels, right? So that by itself cleans up the graph a lot, right? Now we have just little hints of arrows here where we need them so we can see what the direction is if we want. Again, we're seeing this modular structure that comes out of grades. We have, it's a very small school with um, seventh through ninth graders, so we have the junior high and so forth. Um, question? Did I um, now let's do a little bit more, right? So now let's um, tell it what kind of layout algorithm we want to do. So this time, instead of using the default, I'm going to use FR. FR stands for fruchterman rheingold There are two basic layout algorithms we usually use in the force-directed world. fruchterman rheingold is this spring model we just told you about. It's literally a, 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 a set of equations designed to minimize the tension between springs. And there's a spring pushing nodes apart, and there's a spring pushing nodes together. And this is a, a, a solution given a random set of starts, or, or, or perhaps not random set of starting positions, that minimizes um, that objective function um, uh, to, relative to a given schedule. And so the fruchtman rheingold is nice um, uh, because it is probably the single simplest and fastest way to get a clean space-based representation. And so if you try to fit your metric of the correlation of screen distance to graph distance, fruchtman rheingold is usually a pretty good bet. It does a pretty nice job of doing that because it is literally doing its best to optimize that distance to the extent that the springs, the geodesics, are driving the, the way the springs are set. And so you get a graph that looks something like this. The isolates are put over here. On my, the way the algorithm works under the hood is that there's a little invisible string, a little invisible edge sent to a, another invisible node at the middle that you don't see. Um, and so that's why the, your, um, uh, your isolates aren't often outer space somewhere at infinite distance. Um, but you know, that's something. Um, an alternative then is to um, color some, add some more information on this set. So I'm going to cluster this graph. I'm going to try to find some clusters in this network. And I'm going to do it with a clustering algorithm that's native to um, uh, uh, iGraph, which is called InfoMap, and InfoMap is a, um, uh, it, it, I'll talk a little bit more about all the clustering algorithms in a minute, but InfoMap is a way of um, mapping a hashtag sequence onto a set of nodes while doing a random walk through the set of nodes, and if you can minimize that series of hashtag lengths, that's because you've managed to walk around sets of nodes that are closely connected to each other, and that process then helps to, to um, create and identify clusters in the network. It's a really clever solution um, uh, to identifying clusters in the network. Um, and this is what that membership thing works. So this is the info map cluster is what I call this, very creatively, IMC. Um, and the memberships in that look like this, so from node zero, to node 70, right, I'm the 71 nodes in the network, this person's in group five, that person's in group three, this person's in group seven, and so forth. Um, and I just wanted to see what that looked like. We now plot it with respect to the colors, and you can sort of see some of this structure now, right? And so now what we're seeing is that we're getting these similar clusters in similar colors, and that helps bring, draw in a user's eye. Like, this is the exact same layout we had a, a minute ago, and it was really hard to make sense of what was going on in this sort of center set. And now I can say, oh yeah, there's a gap between this set of red nodes and this set of orange nodes, and maybe these pink nodes are a little different from each other. And that helps you in this exploration process to try to see, well, is there something perhaps underlying this clustering that I want to play with? 
All right. Now, I might also decide that in, in addition to the cluster they're part of, I want some information about how popular nodes are. So I'm going to use as the size of their uh, the size of the node, the degree of that node within degree is the what I'm, I'm, I'm modeling. Um, it turns out that iGraph is a little less silly than um, uh, StatNet in terms of the size. So I don't have to log it in this case. I'm, uh, I'm just, you know, just using the base set. But now we have highly central nodes, or the very popular kids are in the middle, they're bigger, um, uh, these isolates are at the side, these little tiny dots over here are our um, uh, nodes that are isolated. I must have told it, I didn't tell it, it must have decided that you don't really want to throw those away, so it left them there for us. There's a nice of it, I didn't expect that. Um, now what I wanted to do is um, contrast that with a couple of different layout algorithms, right, and so they're, 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 that are easy for you to get. Um, and the, the most sort of common layout algorithm, in addition to um, uh, the fruchtman rheingold one, is one called Kamada Kawai. And Kamada Kawai has the same basic idea with the addition of a node repulsion feature for nodes being stacked on top of each other. So it does a multiple pass through the network. It first does something pretty close to a, a, a fruchtman rheingold spring layout. But then if nodes are directly on top of each other, it puts a little penalty and pushes them apart. And so you get this nice jittering effect where nodes aren't laying right on top of each other, and you get a, a, a better ability to see how nodes are, are, are connected um, uh, uh, within these groups. And so now these kind of clusters pop out a little better than they do up here in the fruchtman rheingold where we have nodes that are essentially structurally equivalent or very tightly tied to each other stacked on top of each other. This makes sense, what we're doing? Okay. You should stop me at any time. Please stop. Um, you guys know the, uh, uh, the Ig Nobel Awards, right? Where you, they're only, the, the speaker's only allowed a 30 second speech and if you start talking too long, they have this recording of a kid that says, please stop, I'm bored, right? So, um, my, my undergraduate starts saying that quickly after a while. Um, so it turns out that iGraph, the nice thing about the iGraph layout tools are that um, they essentially have the same exact structure, right? So we're gonna have to do a plot something, what we're plotting, some features, if you go and look into the help, you see there's a lot more features. You can specify the width of the edges, the color of the edges. You can have a, a, a different thing that's sort of going for all those pieces. But the nice thing is that the layout is just specified with a, with a layout command. And there are about 15 different layouts that are there. So you can try them and see what's there and, and read about them and see which ones you like. So this is the Kamada Kawai one where now I've um, uh, colored them according to grade. So this is their grade in school is the coloring now as opposed to that friendship um, uh, cluster I came up with before. And so now the central cluster that was all one cluster when we had it a minute ago, you'll see that there are some kids that are crossing grades here. So these are maybe some cool 11th graders that are hanging out with seniors or something like that. I don't remember, I, I, I suppressed the um, index, right, which you probably shouldn't do. Like you can put an index on it would tell me what color goes with which value and I just didn't put that out. So that's not there. Um, because the default is not to have it, and I didn't tell it to put it there. Um, so there it is. So um, let's see. Uh, this is, you can tell it to curve the arrows, right? So here I'm saying given a little bit of curve, you don't want to go to hell with the joke. Um, but a little bit of curve does one nice thing in a small network like this, is it lets you easily see which edges are reciprocated, right? So this node nominates this node. There's a counter arc going back the other way. That means in a directed graph, there's still reciprocity, whereas this node nominates this one, but this one didn't nominate that one back, right? So in general, I don't like curves, but if the goal is, again, exploration, you're just trying to see, you know, like how much reciprocity do I have in the network, um, and, you know, how is that reciprocity distributed around the network, it's not a bad way to go in and poke around. Um, what am I doing here? So this is the, oh, yes, I, I couldn't resist when I was, I, was, I was reading the manual and they had the different layout algorithms and one of the layout algorithms is layout nicely. <laughs> Who's not going to go with layout nicely, right? I mean, it just seems like you got to give that one a try. Um, and eh, it looks a lot like fruchtman rheingold um, uh, It does a little bit um, worse in my opinion because it's, you know, it sort of put these two clusters on top of each other, but um, there you go. So that's layout nicely. Um, this is um, a multidimensional scaling. Um, a nice thing about, people, are people familiar with, multi, with multidimensional scaling? So multidimensional scaling is an attempt to take a multidimensional object, like a network, and represent it by, the, by 
uh, some k number of vectors that capture the most variance in the multidimensional structure. So here, the default is a two-dimensional, a multidimensional uh, uh, resolution of this. And so we have an x and y. We've embedded this network in a space. And this is the, um, the, the metric result, the two best vectors for describing this space, right? Um, and so again, this is, um, you're going to find that an MDS looks a lot like a fruchtman rheingold um, Under the hood, if, if you were to allow your fruchtman rheingold to never bump into a local minima, never be contingent on the starting places, they should converge on exactly the same thing, like if you were just you know, not bored and were letting let it go. Some really useful layouts, so I can say layout in circle. Again, I'm not sure why you would ever want to do that, but you'd probably want to do that before you did layout as random, right, which is this one. So this is layout randomly. I can't figure out why you'd ever want to use that one, but there it is. Um, and you could lay it out on a sphere. Um, again, you know, maybe if you're actually have, if you have our coordinates on a globe, that would be useful. But all these nodes in the back that look like they're black are just in perspective, right? So they're just far away. There's, there's nothing useful to that information. Um, and there's a bunch of others. So these are all the different kind of layout algorithms that you can get default in the set. A couple that might actually be useful to you, depending on the, on the world you live in. Layout as bipartite is really nice because it puts one mode as a column and the next mode as the other column and sorts it in a way that optimizes and minimizes crossing edges. And so that's a nice way to, uh, to identify um, clusters of networks in a two-mode network. It's a, it's a pretty slick piece that way. It's useless, of course, if you apply it to this graph. Um, star can happen. Um, uh, layout components, if you have multiple component network, it'll tile the components um, uh, from where you started. Um, and some of the others you just have to play with to see what's there. Um, most of these are variants on a spring embedder of some sort. Um, and some of them are also limited to the fact that you have to have a, um, a connected component for them to work. So it's just worth playing with. Um, again, Jam is another one. Here's another, these are just variants in the same thing. And I just put these in here so you have a chance to see um, uh, uh, what's there and to play with it a little bit. Um, what do I have? All right, so now I wanted to try one more um, piece. Where, is, where am I now? Right, that's in the wrong spot. You see, this should have been up ahead, um, but since it, it's only working because I didn't detach StatNet. Um, because it should have yelled at me, because I, I now threw away iGraph. If I detached I, um, uh, StatNet like I was supposed to, this would have also bombed, because I would have no loaded network package. But it turns out this is going to run for me. Um, this is just, again, uh, using the StatNet version of that. Um, all right, so there's one other bit, if, you're, if you like, that I've, that I've played with. There's, again, there are a couple other um, routines that are out there. This one is nice. This is a, uh, if you want to do that kind of interactive um, graph set, um, the Viz Network one um, uh, works pretty well. And so once you've loaded your network up, done what you're supposed to do, don't do this, because look, it's going to yell at me here. So for some reason, I couldn't even tell you why, um, I decided I needed a plier here, probably because it's legacy code that I had around from somewhere um, and just left it in the line. Um, and it told me that that's a really bad thing to do, right? So because I already have dplyr loaded, so loading this one on top of it means that I'm essentially undoing all the good things that dplyr is supposed to be doing for me. Um, but it does what I tell it to do, and it didn't seem to hurt anything. Um, so this um, Viz Network tool is a way of creating interactive network visualizations. It um, is a little restrictive in the sense that it expects certain node names, right? So it expects things to have a node file and a link file is what it's expected to be called. So we need to rename our, very, our original graph edge to the, to, the, to the name links from our node network to the name nodes, right? And then you generate the default network. You get something like this. But this is nice because you can zoom in. So if you have a really big network, um, uh, you can um, get a chance to see it around a little better. And it's, again, one of these sort of, you grab next to something if you want to move that around. But if you grab the node, it's one of these little tangle things up again. Now, the default coloring is kind of a disaster. It's like I'm not sure why you would ever want coloring like that. But one of the nice things about this is that it's in, eminently customizable. If you go into the, um, uh, uh, to the underlying package and look at the options, you can do lots of different colorings, both in shape and shadow and so forth. And so it's really nice in the sense that you can create a lot of elegant um, features in terms of edge widths and colorings and so forth um, uh, in a way that's um, uh, nice and interactive. And so this is that same graph, now just done with some reasonable colors and shading and so forth. Um, it has some interactive features like highlighting ego networks. So if I click on a node and highlight it, then the nodes that are next to it are in darker edges um, and so forth. Right. So it's a nice pit for allowing you to see um, and explore your graph interactively. Um, and I just put that in there. And again, you can pipe that to a web page if you wanted to in the same way we did before. Jimmy, is that a question? 
No. Okay. So this is these are the graph layout options in. Um, and these are a, a selection of the commonly used graph layout options in iGraph. I think they're perfectly reasonable for exploration. They're probably when you once you get to this kind of layer where you can specify some of the edge widths, I would turn it into an undirected graph in, in, in for publication, for example, and maybe make directed edges weighted a little heavier or something. Um, so I wouldn't actually publish a graph that has these kinds of double edges on it because that looks silly. Um, but you're, but this package would probably get you close to something that could be. Um, a, a, a publishable, you know, reasonable um, from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, I want to show you briefly um, how we do layouts um, uh, when I'm trying to do layouts. And so when I typically do it, I use this program called Payek, P-A-J-E-K. Um, it's a free program. I sent around a list, uh, a link to the, to the network here a bit ago. Um, I'm only going to give 10 minutes because we've got to get to group detection as well, but I just want to, and we're going to use this program then too, so I'm going to sneak it in you twice. Um, but the, uh, the thought is um, I want you to see what this program looks like. What's nice about this program is it's optimized for giant networks, and by which I mean um, it doesn't blink at a network of a billion nodes. Right? So the new version of, of Payak XXXL will happily take networks with multiple billions of nodes right? and multiple billions of edges. Um, the underlying architecture is made to be fast. Right? That means it's not necessarily made to be easy to use. Right? And so and there's a bit of a trade-off between the two. Um, but it's, it's these crazy Slovenian guys who have been working on this program now for a number of years. Um, and uh, Andre is a kick in the pants. There's a great book called Exploratory um, uh, Network Analysis with Payek. Um, and so if you want to play with this program much, I highly recommend it. Um, the nice thing about it from a data standpoint is that this is what the files look like. With, um, they're just simple text files. Right? And so it's a two-part text file where you have your vertices, some, some features of the vertices, and then an arcs or edge list. Um, and so it's a very simple, um, uh, easy to understand, and easy to write to um, a network format um, that's nice. The one thing that um, is a little bit nasty about um, Payek is that in order to be fast, it's assuming everything's sorted right, right? So, if, so you're, what we're going to do is and when you do analysis in Payek is you create new objects. So I'm going to create a partition if I'm doing clustering. I'm going to create a vector if I'm getting centrality or something. And it's going to spit it out in the same order as my original one. Um, but there's nothing explicitly linking one object to the other. They're completely separate objects. And so if I do something like sort the network first, then do something and forget later that I sorted the network again, I'm going to have a mismatch. So you've got to be a little bit careful of that. I mean, when you start getting multiple objects going at once, it can be a pain in the ass. The other thing, as a general rule, I dislike point and click programs because um, you have to be, you're going to get audited someday, um, uh, either by your company, by your boss, or by the reviewers, where they say, you know, I think that's a great idea, but you need to change this one element. And if what you've done is poke around a GUI for 15 minutes and you have no idea where the hell you are, um, uh, you can't get back to where you started in order to redo that. Um, the nice thing about Payek is that it keeps a log of everything you did and you can replay those logs. So you can just go to macro, play, um, uh, and go to the log where you're at and you can just literally play this, the, the thing again and get back to where you were last time. And so the nice thing to do is that if you're in the process of doing this, if you're, if you're going to work with this program much at all, it's a great idea to once you have an analysis file you like or you've come up with something you want to do, take that log file, save it in your analysis folder with an eight, say this is the version I submitted to ASR on May 15th. Um, and you can go back and you can pull it up and play it again, you know where you're at, right? And also the, the log files also create a, um, are they in this here? Uh, they also create a, um, a template for writing your own scripts and doing things. And I'll show you how to do that in a bit. Um, but if you want to draw something, you just load one of these networks up, you draw it, you draw the network, and um, what it normally looks like when you first open it is like this, right? And so its default start is just a mess like anything else. But then you can do layout, energy, Kamada Kawai, for example, and it'll give us a spread like that. Or I can say, Layout energy Fuchtman Rheingold 2D, and it gives me that. Or I can say layout energy Fuchtman Rheingold 3D, and then I can hit the S and spin it around, and if we're all high, we'll be very happy. <laughs> um, uh, but there it is, right? So the idea is that you can play with these kinds of things in various and sundry ways. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the features that it does, but um, once you get a graph that you like, and Control K is just another way to do the, um, uh, just to do the Kamada Kawai layout. Um, go to graph only, get rid of the labels, 
Um, you can click on nodes and move them around. I find that when I'm really trying to get ready to the point where I'm, I'm going to publish a graph as exposed to explore a graph or share a graph with an audience, I often want to go in and do some micro features where I can you know, correct something like this where I have a really tangle of nodes. I might go in and just move that to the edge a little bit. Right? You're not doing huge violence to the world. You're not lying to anybody. But you're making something that is otherwise an occlusion, like this line that's running under another one, a little harder to see by doing that. Now, you're not going to do that with a network of 100,000 nodes. But if I'm trying to give an exemplar for people of 20 or 30, it's there. Under info, is where you get this fit statistic. Um, uh, this is a fit statistic that Dan McFarland and I proposed, and the payout guys were nice enough to put it in. So this is a nice way of getting, so you can see that the, the correlation between your layout and your GDS statistic is 0.73. That's a pretty nice fit, right? So that's telling us that we're not doing a huge amount of damage to the display of, to the cluster sort of display, of the distance display of this network by putting it in two dimensions. If I were to do it in three dimensions, info, let's see how that helps or hurts. Eh, it fits a little better, right? Not surprisingly, it fits better. The correlation is higher, but it might be harder for us to see because you're still stuck seeing it in two dimensions, right? So again, Shift F2, for those of you that like shortcuts, gets us back to the um, uh, 2D layout. Um, one of the things that, um, uh, that uh, Payek does for you is it um, lets you specify some of the things that other programs treat as um, uh, defaults. So this factor thing is a lot, lot like the resolution parameter. Was there a question? Where'd it go? Yes. Uh -huh. Is that something that's important if you're including the visualization in a paper, for example? Um, is that often important? Or I think it's important. <laughs> um, uh, I think no one else on the planet thinks it's as important as I do. <laughs> and so there's not a reviewer in the world. So if you get a reviewer that says, where's your fit statistic? You can call me up and say, Moody, why'd you reject my paper, right? Because um, <laughs> it's probably me or Dan that are the only people that have said you should have a fit statistic for your set. But our, part of our goal um, uh, is to think about visualization not just as eye candy and pretty pictures. But it should also be have some scientific feature to it. And audiences should know how much they're being uh, sort of distorted in the fit. Now the one problem with, and this is, you know, like I can get on my high horse and be all I want, but the honest truth is one of the problems with geodesic distance sort of measures um, is that they're um, computationally expensive. So it's easy to do on a network of 71 nodes. If I have a network of 1,000 nodes, I've got to be patient to wait for it. For Payek is going to tell me, do you really want me to do this? <laughs> right? Because it's going to take a while. Because right? it's got to calculate the all pairs distance between all other of 1,000 nodes, and that just takes time. So, so in, in practice, you don't often see people requiring it. Um, I, I mean, no one requires it. Um, but I think it's good practice if you can do it. Yeah. This is great. More questions? So another thing, to, to this factor feature for Fruchtman and Rheingold, remember what you have are springs. So you have a spring pulling me together and spring pushes apart. One says well, we'd have sort of an even balance between those two. If I set this factor up really high, I say let's give it a factor of six. What that's saying is I'm going to push away a lot more than I'm pulling in. I click OK, layout, energy, Fruchtman and Rheingold, 2D. It just pushes everything out to the edge, right? And so if you have a really sparse network, even a factor of one is going to do this. And so if you look at your graph and go, oh, man, it's like it's a kumbaya world. They're all in a circle. Everyone loves each other. Like everything's great. Like, your factor is probably too high, right? You probably just pushed everything out to the set. So go in here and set that thing out again to say, well, it should be lower than that. Um, let's take a factor of, I don't know, like 0.2. Now it's too small. And then it's going to put everything into a chomp. So what you have to do as a, as, a, you know, as a user is get in there and fuss with this. One's not a bad starting point, but if you do one and you end up getting a line, if it just sort of collapses down to a single dimension, then your factor's probably too small. If it pushes everything out to the periphery, then your factor's probably too large. All right. All right, so I promised to tell you to reveal the secret in the sauce. Um, let's see if I can find this now. Um, and it's R25. Where are we? Here, we're in materials, 2018. No. So um, your colored badges came from this little guy. So this is the network of you. Let's go options, lines, grayscale, options, lines. Um, different widths. So this is the number of overlapping interests everyone in this room has with everyone else in this room, right? And so if you then lay this out um, without cheating, um, that's not true. Well, I have my factor all out of whack now, don't I? You get something that looks like this. 
Um, and you'll notice there's not a super strong cluster structure to this, um, but I somehow managed to get um, uh, four or five clusters out of this network. How did I do that? Well, I did a couple of things, and this is a, uh, I didn't just go, which you might have expected me to do, if I were to go to network, um, uh, create a partition, communities, Louvain method, I can easily get one, go like that, control P. I'm not teaching you how to do this because we don't have time for that, I just want you to see what I did. This is what a, a Louvain clustering does. Eh, it doesn't do too good um, because you can see like this pink cluster here, you've got a lot of strong ties crossing between it. So I made something up. What I did is I said, first let's take this network, create a new network, let's transform, let's remove any lines with value lower than two. All right, so now, create a new network, sure. So now I have a network that are um, only components um, uh, if you share at least two things with somebody else. All right, so graph only. I don't want that partition anymore. Uh, let's go control week three. Okay. So now what I have are strong components, or weak components, excuse me, but it doesn't matter because it's undirected, um, of people who are connected by, who share at least a sequence of two interests or more. All right. So now then I go back to the original graph, right here, and I put that coloring on it, lay it over. And so we got some people that are connected um, by you know, two set, and some people who only share one item with everyone else in the network. So they're not in a cluster at all. That doesn't do any good. I can't give you a badge that say you're an, a leftover, <laughs> right? Um, so I gotta do something about that. So instead I go to operations, networks, and partitions, expand this partition. I do what's called an influence partition, which is I assign that if you don't have an assignment, I assign you to whatever most of your neighbors are in. Right? And so that's what I did here. So I did that with all. And then I look at it. And now look at that. Everyone has a partition, right? So you're either in the green group, the pink group, the red group, three people in the yellow group. That's great. And that's, you know. It's clustered, but they don't cluster very well. Um, and I wanted a picture that looked good, right? Because that doesn't, I can't tell a good story about that. So um, let's do something else here. Let's go to macro play. Um, see. This is how I really work. This is why you're wondering how I get anything done in my life. Um, I don't. Um, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an in group weight. And I'm going to say that if you share a group, you're going to count as more than if you don't. So I open that little guy and I say, let's double the weight within groups. Go like that, and now redraw it, and then lo and behold, oh, options, values of lines are similarities. Ta-da! <laughs> right, and so then I get nice to see groups. Now I haven't lied to you, um, I did yesterday, but I haven't lied to you and the adult because there's all the information still there, I just didn't tell you that I reweighted the set, right? And so, um, by, so this is when I say that you really can create a lot of difference depending on these choices you make. It is true that um, I've completely changed the structure of this graph from what it was given to us by a small number of not un seemingly like bad ideas, but it does, it's not a far number of steps down a primrose path to hell in this kind of case, right? And so um, this is really largely a minimal group experiment um, uh, in the room, but it does have this effect of um, uh, making it so you can see the different sets. Another just quick visualization trick I do almost always and when I have weighted networks, network, uh, create a new network, transform, sort lines, line values, is um, put the dark lines on top. Right, and so then you have, the, you can see where the, where the density hits, right, and so this is a nice way to get that set. All right, so again, I didn't expect any of you to like follow along with that and do it and be keeping those. They, they are, it's all being recorded, so you can do it if you want. Um, but if you're interested in doing it, what I like about this program is it allows you to do a lot of visualization things on very big networks. It has a huge array of different tools. We've only just scratched the surface of them here that I'm showing you. Once you export things, you can export them as EPS, pull them into Illustrator. Right, so then you have a vector graphic feature that you can do something with and make it prettier, change the colors, change line thicknesses, all those kinds of things. The SVG creates interactive web pages, and so all these things that you've seen me doing where I'm hovering over nodes with ideas on them or something like that, that's an automatic push out from this. It's a very easy way to get these kinds of things from a program, and it works quite nicely. Um, the uh, VOS viewer, these are um, uh, just to tie back to earlier today. If you send something out as uh, one of these VOS viewer files, files um, uh, these are um, virtual reality files, old style virtual reality files. They're also the files that you can use in a 3D printer. Um, and so we got them to update the software so that Payek will now write out the kind of files that your 3D printer wants. So if you want to do a real cool thing, like when you're going into your presentation at some point, you can hand out a model 
of your network, right? <laughs> um, and that little plastic model um, uh, and spread it around and let folks look at it. Um, uh, and then, in fact, I think that's the one time 3D would actually work as opposed to a vision set. All right, so that's enough on um, uh, sort of network visualization. It was supposed to be a little candy. Um, uh, we'll take the last 45 minutes and talk about um, ours options for clustering networks, um, uh, if folks are interested in that. Um, before questions, comments, please. Are there any uh, tools for showing diffusion across networks, sort of the temporal, um, that, that don't involve movies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes and no. Um, we, our strategy for that has typically been, um, this is the part I actually skipped over in the, um, uh, in the presentation, um, where'd it go? Um, it's been to do to um, plot the diffusion trees, and so we do that um, in two ways. And so the classic way to do it is to um, you know, imagine the proportion of the population infected at any given step and point. You get these classic sinusoidal curves. Um, and we can, you can do that by a simulation, of course. So these are what are known as trace curves in, in a network, right? So I just populated it out. Um, so people have tried to do it um, uh, with coloring. That doesn't work so well because people can't see it. Um, we found this to be the most effective way to um, visualize diffusion in a closed network, which is to actually identify our seeds and follow it down as a tree. Um, and so this is a network that happened to be um, a, a dynamic network. The red edges are ones that overlap in time, and so these are concurrent edges in the network. And then if this is the, the, um, uh, the edges themselves are concurrent, this is um, what the network looks like if, it were, if, if flow through the network required a concurrent edge upstream. And so this is a nice way of showing that in this particular context anyway, you never would have reached most of these people had there not been concurrency in the network. And so it was a nice way for us to make that point. Is there a name for that? For this plot, I'm a, just a tree. <laughs> I don't have a good name for it. Um, Jake Fisher did a nice um, version of this, I'm a, kind of a, a layered layout. This comes out of Payek. I'm a, we do this. And this is going to look ridiculous here, but under this layers set, you can just do it in y direction, and so then you, when you, if it's a tree, then it's meaningful, and you can optimize it that way. Actually, if you if you if you have many graphs that have lots of these kind of layers, if you're really modeling hierarchy, I really recommend a program called YED Y E D as a as a graphical program because it, it was built for business school people, and so it has a bunch of hierarchical charting tools in it, um, and so it's it's it has the layouts optimized for hierarchies. Yes. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an end note paper in the journal Network Science. It um, uh, came out about two and a half years ago by Jake Fisher that highlights how to do these kind of plots. All right, um, I'm going to switch gears here quickly and um, show you a little bit about how um, we find groups and networks. Um, so again, um, I'm not going to try to uh, do the entire thing. I'm a live in R. If you want to look online, I'm a, in the Dropbox is this um, is the non-markdown version of this folder. I'm a network community detection Moody 2018.R. I'm going to need paragraph returns in my titles pretty soon. Um, same basic header. This is almost exactly the same as before. Not surprisingly, because it was done in about the same time. Um, uh, which was not long ago. Um, uh, and so you set your working directory, all this kind of stuff. We're going to skip over those pieces. And I'm going to say we're going to go straight to iGraph. All right, so we're going to find, um, is that true? Let me see, is that true? Yes, that's true. This time, um, uh, we're creating the network from the data frame. Again, n minus 1, edges minus 1. We do the set, take a look at our network with a little glimpse tool. We start, so we know we have 71 observations, two variables. We have a node ID and the group they belong to, which is the grade. So person 0 is in grade 12, person 7 is in grade 8, and so forth. We're going to create from that a net. So this is a network, it's a graph from data frame, GE, so forth and so on. In this case, I was um, a little better person than I was last time, in which I told it how many vertices are there. Right? So the number of vertices is um, uh, coming from this other set. I'm keeping it directed for now. Um, and I took a look at the first five of those, these edges. So there's a edge one is from, uh, is that right? No, so there's 570, there's 71 vertices, um, uh, and they have two attributes, a na node name and a group they belong to. Um, again, plot it, make sure we have something that looks like it's supposed to. Um, the first and simplest community you can detect is um, strong or weak components. And so in this case, 
um, I said the strong, strongly connected component is equal to the clusters program on net, and I'm saying the type is strong. What's a strong component? Last in the day? Anyone? Not that they're tied to everyone else, but everyone in a strong component. Come on, if they're not that tired yet. We got it, we only got it. We're, I know we're, we're, we're dragging, we're getting slow. And your name tags are all below the table, so I'm not ready to call on anybody. Dan, what's a strong component? I know your name. <laughs> strong, in a strong component, if I respect edges, I can reach everyone else in my strong component. So a strongly connected component means respecting the direction of the edge, I can reach everyone else that's the same color, right? So in this case, we end up with a couple of small strong components. So every yellow node, it's possible that I could reach every other yellow node if I trace the direction of the edges. I couldn't, this node can't reach anyone else, these nodes can't, and these nodes can't, and that's because they have all incoming ties or all outgoing ties, but not both an ingoing and outgoing, so there's no cycle that runs through them. So it's not that they're directly connected, it's that they're all indirectly connected, or respecting the direction. Right? Now a weakly connected component means that if I do the same thing, but ignore the direction of the arrows, who can I reach? Right? So this is just a, a set of folks where it's possible, irrespective of the direction of the tie, to make a hop between it, and that means that I have one clump and a couple of isolates in this case. Those are pretty um, uh, uninteresting connected components. So instead we're going to look at a, a, a series of these. And the nice thing about iGraph is that the um, syntax is all the same, essentially, for how these things work. You have some, com you're going to create an object, which is a cluster style object, and that object is a set of lists, and there's a name for the type of the clustering, for the network that goes into it, whether it's weighted or not, and some other features that might have to do with that graph. And so the first one I'm doing is a thing called edge betweenness. And so edge betweenness is a fun little algorithm that Gervon and Newman came up with, where you imagine a network, and I remove the weakest edge. That is the edge that's most likely to split that graph in half. And it turns out that the edge that's most likely to split that graph in half is the edge that has the highest edge betweenness, as opposed to node betweenness. That means that the number of geodesics that flow through that edge is the highest. So I remove that edge, see what I'm left with. Well, it's still connected. Remove another edge, see what happens. Keep removing edges in that order, right? In the order of the edges carrying the most weight until the graph falls apart. That's my first, um, uh, and that's what's going to create this hierarchical structure. So if you were to look at this dendrogram and look here, when I removed an edge, there was some edge in this process that split off this node from the rest of the graph. And then later, this node got split off from the rest of the graph, and then this node got split off from the rest of the graph all the way up until we had nothing left but isolates. Right. And so then you go through and you reconstruct the network of, all this, of this hierarchy tree. At each layer, you uh, calculate the modularity score, that quality score that Peter was telling us about, and you say, at what level of that reconstruction process have I maximized the modularity? And in so doing, and that's what we define as our clusters. And so in this case, we end up with it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. Oh yeah, seven, eight, those are my isolates, clusters. And I'm gonna plot the network by the colors, and that's what it looks like. All right, so these are my clustering sets. I get one kind of mishmash here of bright orange, a red one, a dark blue one, a light blue one, and a sort of a teal one um, in the network. Now that's just one of the choices that I have. Um, oftentimes, once I have this kind of, uh, what am I doing there? Oh yeah, so what, what I did is here is I now took the, um, my symmetric network that I have before. Um, I took the, I set a vertex attribute, which is this membership in the cluster, and I assigned that to a new network. And so now I have as a network attribute being a member of that cluster. That's just a way of saving it. Turns out it doesn't work very well. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, so I'm gonna just ignore that for later. I gave you code here for what you might actually want to do, which is that I might want to um, pull the, 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 the data from the membership cluster object here. Um, so I'm gonna say there's a thing called members, which is the community you're assigned to. I'm gonna turn that into a data set, right, to a data frame, right? So I'm gonna take the Gervon Newman cluster ID as a data frame that looks like this. Um, you want to make sure your node IDs are numbers because by default um, it's not going to make them numbers, it's going to make them those horrible factor variables that John hates um, and we're going to, we wouldn't want that. And so once we get it, we then have this data set that has a node ID and the cluster variable we want and so then we can merge that onto our other um, data set 
And so this is our, the data set at the end of the day we're going to want to take home and do an analysis with. Right? So, so the nice thing about this is that each time we create a new variable, we're going to go through these three steps where we pull off the data we need from that clustering object. We're going to recode it so that the, no, the numbers are sensible. That is, the numbers are numbers as opposed to characters. And then we're going to merge it to our base data set. And we're going to do that again then with, um, so that's the, uh, this is the leading, this is another version, it's leading eigenvector. I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each one of these in this kind of detail, but what you'll see I've given you here are about six different um, uh, ways of, of identifying communities in a network. Each time I generate the communities, I test its modularity, I see this one is about 0.59 and so forth, and I'm not going to go through each of these algorithms here because I'm going to go through them slightly in a second. And so the code is there for you to see what each of these look like. Um, what you would like to know, of course, isn't that I've just collected all these different clusters. You'd like to know which one is the one to use, right? So should I use walk trap? Should I use the vein? Should I use something else? Um, one way to figure that out is to do these kind of comparisons. So one of the things that worked out nicely here is that Kamada Kawai gives us the same layout every time. If, again, if I were a better person, I would have set a random seed and made sure it was that the case. Um, but you can just sort of eyeball it. So here I can look at the walk trap communities. And I can say that they took that one orange cluster we had before and split it into two. It looks like um, they also created a, a merged a community up here in terms of the yellow that used to be two communities and so forth. So you could just eyeball it and see what's there. Or you can do a pairwise comparison with something called the adjusted RAND statistic. And I can say how similar is one cluster, in this case the walk trap community, to the eigenvector community, excuse me. <coughs> And we can see they overlap quite highly. So they have a RAND score of 0.92, um, which is a pairwise similarity score. You adjust that for chance, it goes down to about 0.73. Um, so they, that's, that's reasonable, almost not enough. And then we can look at this, compare the, um, what do you call it, the uh, Louvain community version to uh, the uh, Nuvon Move and the edge between this one. And you get a slightly lower fit, right? So those things don't match quite as well. Again, it's a little hard to see. Um, so what I did instead was this, slideshow from current slide, is that going to work? And so this is each of, whoa, come on, there we go. This is each of the uh, uh, resulting communities that we could have won through. So we have edge between this, leading eigenvector, walk trap. Um, Leading eigen, for the, so this is the one that's probably most familiar to social scientists. Um, uh, this is effectively a, um, an application of factor analysis, right? So what you're doing is that you're taking a, a network, you're splitting it into based on um, uh, the signs of the, of, the, of the leading eigenvector, um, and then you're repeating that process over and over again. And so it sort of smells a little like um, uh, 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 factor analysis in the sense that you get groups that load on a particular um, uh, uh, factor that way. Um, walk trap we talked about a little bit before. It's a version of where you can imagine doing a random walk on the network. Where do you end up revisiting many, many times? And this is, is how that finds it. The Louvain method is the one that Peter told us about um, this morning. Um, label propagation is a version of, is, it's kind of similar to the walk trap or the uh, info map idea where what you're doing is you're randomly per per permuting something through the network and seeing where it sticks. In this case, you get a sort of a big diffuse cluster here where, that are seen as separate in that set. The nice thing about these kind of comparative plots is you can do a nice side-by-side um, uh, you know, -side comparison. See where people are matching, see where they're missing. Practically, what I prefer to do is um, not decide amongst any of these. Like the ideal thing to do instead is to do what's called a consensus graph. And so I say for each pair of nodes in the network, how often are they jointly in the same group together? Right? And so it doesn't matter which grouping algorithm I use, I can then count up how often they have. Unfortunately, R doesn't have a routine to do that. Right? And so in addition to not being able to tell you the resolution value to know if you picked, because all of these are ultimately, well, well, I don't know if label propagation and info map are, but, not, but most of these are ultimately um, optimizing on, a res on the modularity score, and all modularity scores have this resolution problem set to one. And so instead what we do, um, uh, what I've done in the past, is um, we try to generate an, a version of, um, is it open up for us? Thank you. Um, go back to that.
So again, in PayEx, the nice thing is you, whenever you draw one of these graphs, let's move our graph up again, um, I can easily identify um, the network here by saying network, create a partition, communities, Louvain method, using um, a resolution parameter. So here I can say the resolution parameter is one to a million to zero, whatever I want. In this case, I might decide I want to make the resolution parameter two. These other parameters are essentially how patient you are for how good a fit you want to take, right? So I'm going to say, let's do lots of random restarts. Because it's a small network, I'll give it 100 random restarts. Not 1,000, I'm not crazy. Um, uh, and then click OK. It does its thing. Um, uh, it says it took it like no time at all. The modularity score is 0.44. It found 10 communities. Um, and it gives you a little bit of information about how hard it was to find those communities, so how many restarts did it have to do, and so forth. Control P gives us our clusters. And so here we can see we get, you know, again, this sort of, you know, two clusters built here, another cluster built there. It's still hard to know if this is right. It's even harder to know if uh, that was the right resolution value. Now, if I'm just exploring, what I would do is go back and say, well, let's just try that again. Network, create partition, communities, Louvain method, multi-disk isn't boring to me, and I'm even standing up here. Let's try, you know, 0.5 instead and see what happens. Now I get six communities, and I can look at that and say, well, does that smell better? Does that feel right? I don't know, maybe it does. Um, but it's not satisfying in the long run to do it this way, right? Because you're going to poke around. So again, if you're just exploring, if the goal is to see what's there, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Instead, what you might want to do is um, try, you know, if, the, if there's a problem with, you know, if you can, if, this is a general thing whenever you have to make a choice, right? If you're forced to pick between A and B, what you really want to do is say, give me both, right? So instead of picking a, a, a resolution value between 0 and 100, let's just run them all and see what happens, right? Um, and so we can do that uh, by defining a macro. Um, I can get back to where I was. Um, my life is organized around grants, if you haven't noticed. Um, And so what I did is I wrote uh, what we call a resolution value sweep macro. And so this is, the, the, again, remember I told you the nice thing about Payak is that under the hood there's a scripting language. And so I wrote a little program, just a little loop, to go through and tell it to um, write this thing. Let's open it with that. And so what this thing did is it wrote a program for me I'm a, that is a really, really repetitive program. And because I'm boring and don't want to do a repetitive thing over and over and over again, I wrote another program to write this program, right? And so what it does is it says read in my network and then test the modularity with um, a modularity with a resolution value of 0.5. Let's do that four or five times because there's random variability. Then bump it up to, let's look at that a bunch of times. Oh, that's the wrong one. Where's the resolution value? Yeah, 0.3 then to 0.35, and then to 0.4, and then to 0.45. I, I just ran the whole damn thing forever, but that's okay. It doesn't take long to run, right? And so I can run this thing, um, and I just, it's 4.36, let's just run it, just so you can see. Um, so open that up, so it just does this thing. Um, and so now it's running the entire thing over and over and over again, and instead of typing it, I can just get it to go, and it's writing the partition out to a finding. So each, each time it, it finds a cluster result, it writes that out to a file. Right. And then later what I can do is compare those files. And you think, God, Moody, how long am I going to watch this? Um, it's about done. So see, it's done. It just did the entire range between um, a, a resolution value of 0 0.3 to 2 in less than a couple, you know, less than a minute for me to fumble over my words. Um, then once you have that, what do you do with it? Well, you need to somehow analyze all those partitions. And so what we've done is we've come up with a, a set of routines in SAS. They're not in um, uh, R yet, but um, if any of you want to write them in R, that would be awesome. Um, that go through and calculate from current slide. There we go. Hello. Um, uh, this set of um, um, there we go. The set of curves that Peter showed us earlier, right? And so what we can do now is we've gone through and out of all those partitions that it saved, it goes through and finds which of the partitions have the highest that optimizes within that set and then plots this curve, this outer envelope that Peter was telling us about on one axis, and identifies where the um, resolution value hits. 
and the number of clusters that result. So if I just start with a cluster with a value of one, that's actually a pretty unstable, so this is the solution that R gives me, that's a pretty unstable part of the solution space. Um, it ends up generating um, a, a fair number of different partitions, whereas a little bit higher I get a, a strong clustering set, set where it levels out, and certainly lower I get a, a strong clustering set where it levels out, and the number of groups remains about the same. I can then actually compare each of those partitions to each of the optimal positions to every other of the optimal partitions and see how similar they are. Right? So that's what this heat map is doing for me. And it's showing me that there's a set of partitions out here at the end right, that are all really the same. I mean, there's a little bit of variability between the two, um, but these guys are really pretty similar. There might be something else in there. So what I would do if I were trying to like, you know, publish a paper on this school is I would go in and I'd look at one of these solutions, maybe one of those solutions, all right, and see how they differ. In this particular range, so I'm above one, I look like I'm looking um, there, that's in this set of the nine. So I'd go ahead and pick a value like one of these guys, like 1.85 um, or something, and I would go look at that cluster solution to see what it looks like and see if I believe it. The other thing I thought, and this is the point that I'm a, Peter pointed out before is that if I've already gone to all this work, I've calculated all these partitions, I know they're there, getting the consensus graph now is trivial, right? So I've already had to do the comparison to generate these sets. So now let's generate a network, which is the number, because I told you I can turn a network into anything, right? So now I have a network of partition solutions. This might be one upping on Peter. He turns everything into a partition. I turn all of his partitions into a new network. Awesome. Um, and so when you do that, right, you can then say, here's the original network and the clustering of that network. Now let's weight the edges by how often they, they fall into the same cluster and compare that to the results we get. And so the, the, what you find is that the nine cluster solution, these folks are always in the same set, right? So the darkest lines always fall in that nine cluster solution. And that's a really nice um, a, a way for us to say, here we go. These are the clusters that are probably real in this network, conditional on the things that I tested, right? Now, if you really want to go all out crazy, right, you can, instead of trying to eyeball this and squint and say, yeah, I think the nine cluster solution that I calculated on here fits the consensus graph best, you can just recluster the consensus graph, right? And then, of course, you see where this is going. Like, you can rinse, wash, and cheat as long as you want. Um, but the beauty is this consensus graph converges to one solution almost instantly. Like, once you do this convergence a couple times, like, you get these kinds of plots here where you always get the same answer. We're pretty darn close to it. And so it's a really nice way to, to sort of home in. Is it, is, is, it, is it home or hone, like honing a knife? It's a hone in. So you always hone in on the right solution, um, uh, in that case, um, uh, in a way that's um, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so it's a nice way to, to play with this. Um, I think that it's, um, it's got to just be a matter of time before one of you are jockeys out there who's like got an interest and a desire not to poke around in Payek or Gephi or one of these other programs are going to write this code for us. Um, uh, so you'll be our hero next year when we can sort of share that package with everyone else. Um, strong hint. Um, uh, but in the meantime, there are ways of getting here if that's what you want to do. So that's a lot of Moody in a short amount of time. Um, questions, comments, thoughts, concerns at this point on graphing, on clustering? And any of this stuff? What we haven't even gotten to, this is going to, come on, um, <laughs> is that oftentimes, they, they, it's, this, is, this is one of the things that often happens in a stats or a methods class, is we give, we give you an example and beat the hell out of a toy example that's nothing like what you're really going to look like in the real world. Oftentimes, the networks that we want to cluster have thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes. And most of these divisive clustering routines will return clusters that are too big. Right, so oftentimes when I, do, when I do this kind of a routine on something like one of my web of science networks where I have you know, 50,000 or 100,000 nodes in the network, it'll generate something that says there are 100 groups in it, but those groups are each gonna have still 1,000 nodes in it, and it's often bigger than I want. And so the routine that we've developed in our shop is to often then take those clusters and cluster again. And so we end up doing a hierarchical ordering of the clustering to see that there might be the case that these 1,000 nodes are in fact all distinct from the other 100,000 nodes in the network, but that, that doesn't mean there aren't divisions within that set, and so it's nice to do that. Now, there are routines that do that natively. Like, so there are some, um, uh, some tools out there. I'm for Oslom, O-S-L-O-M is the, is, the, is the one that I'm most familiar with, that optimizes that kind of a hierarchical feature. Um, it's a really buggy program, at least it has been for me. 
Um, but that's a way, of, so this is all a point of saying, to the extent that this process is a data reduction and understanding process, it need not result in a single level. It might result in a multiple levels, right? So you might have to rinse, wash, repeat this process multiple times. All right, any other thoughts? Everyone exhausted? Little bit, little bit. This is another, another problem with the way we do this, this sequence is that by this point in the program, you should have had a spring break by now. Um, uh, uh, we, but we're giving you a whole semester in five days, so you're just like, you know no time for a spring break. Um, all right, thanks folks, that's all we got for today. Um, if you have um, dietary issues, um, uh, if you want to come to the dinner tomorrow night, um, uh, there's gonna be downstairs, 6.30. If it's a nice time, if the sun's shining like this, then it's not completely unbearably hot, we'll be able to be outside on the patio and say hi to folks. Um, if, as is predicted, it's a thunderstorm, we'll be downstairs in the atrium. So um, either way, please join us um, uh, if you can, um, uh, and it'd be great to see you. If you have dietary issues for which a pig picking is not in your um, uh, repertoire, um, please let me know by email. That's really the only thing I remember. Okay. All right, folks, see you tomorrow.